So he is the CEO of Cook Media Group. Without further ado, let's welcome our guest, Phil Cook. Well, thank you very much. Greetings from Hollywood. It's great to be here. <laughs> I'm, I'm thrilled to be on. I loved being in Manila when I was there two or three years ago with my wife, Kathleen. And we spent day after day doing teaching and talking about media with pastors and media professionals from all over the city. And we just had a terrific, terrific time. So it's great to connect, reconnect really with you again, Tommy. This is fantastic opportunity. So I'm thrilled. I'm excited about being here. This is great. So the reason why, uh, that's why we're very thankful to have you as a guest, especially here in the Philippines. Media is so important. Yeah. It's too important that celebrities become politicians. Yeah. Our president is a, is a celebrity. That's <laughs> Our, true. It's a reality. That's how media affects us right now. And yeah. it's nice to hear from someone from Hollywood. You know, the first thing I want to ask, especially you've been in that industry, how in the world did you discover it's your direction, your career, your calling to be in yeah. the media? That's a great question. I started in high school. I, 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 my dad was a pastor, local pastor, and I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And in high school, I had a group of friends that we took my dad's little old Super 8 movie camera, just a home movie camera back in those days, and uh, we made little short films. We made space movies and army movies and mafia movies, all kind of stuff. Crazy, crazy stuff. And uh, never thought, I never in a million years thought I would actually be a producer in Hollywood of all places. And I remember going to college thinking, you know, maybe I'll take my films with me to college. And maybe there's some guys there that would like to make these movies with me. And I remember unpacking the first day I was in school. I was in the dormitory in college. I was unpacking my suitcase and a couple of my films fell out. And a guy, another student across the hall said, hey, I I'm taking a film class. I can show you how to edit those little films. I didn't know you could actually cut film or edit. I didn't know. I was totally stupid. I didn't know anything about it. So he took me down to the film class and uh, we started working on my little movie. And the professor was there. It was late at night. He was there working on a project. And when he was leaving at the end of the night, he came over and introduced himself to me and said, you know, I've been watching your little film here. And um, I have students that have been taking classes for two or three years and they still don't shoot this well. He said, would you mind if I showed your film in my class tomorrow? So I thought, well, sure, if I could sit on the back row and see what happens. And so the next day uh, I went into his class. They showed my little movie. I sat on the back row. And the interesting thing was, Tommy, at the end of the film, they all talked about it. It wasn't a great film. It was a pretty terrible movie, a little movie, actually. But when it was over, they started talking about it. And this, this idea hit me, a moment of revelation that I've not had before or since. It was the most amazing moment I've ever had in my life. It was like God just spoke to me at that moment and said, if you can do something with a camera that makes people talk like this, this is what you're supposed to do with your life. And literally, I changed my major that day. I was a piano major. I was a music major. And I switched it to majoring in film and television. And I changed it th that day. And I just have never looked back. And I've always been fascinated. I mean, it's interesting. We live in a media-driven culture. Today, the media is the language people speak. I mean, think of all the social media platforms. My son-in-law, Chris Guerra, is a TikTok star. He's got millions of views on TikTok with little short videos he does. And that's the world we live in today. And I just worry that as Christians, if we can't tell our story in this media-driven world, if we can't speak the language of media, I think we'll eventually fail. And I think we'll lose this generation. We just, as Christians and the church, we just really need to understand how media works and how to tell our story that way, because it's so very, very important if we're going to make an impact in the world today. Okay. My next question is this, uh, especially you're talking about the media career. Um, sure. Oftentimes people, especially millennials, the reason why millennials are easily giving up because they are looking at the highlight reel of a person. The highlight reel, like for example, if it's Michael Jordan, they yep. only watch the highlight reel, but not the, the mistakes, the errors. So when you started out your media career, what was the first job? How did you, what made you decide that's the first thing I'm gonna do? So. Um, I've had some I've had some terrible jobs, terrible jobs in media. I, I started out and I'm a big believer that 
if you really feel called into the media, if you're a young filmmaker, you're a young writer or an actor or producer or director, I really feel like you should take whatever comes along. I mean, I was getting sandwiches for people. I was getting coffee for people. If they would let me on a movie set or a television set, I would do it. My first real job was moving set pieces around. I was working on the carpenter crew and we were building set pieces for the studio and I was moving them around and loading them in and loading them out. And then I graduated from there and got on the lighting crew so I could work with lights. And then after that, I started working with cameras. And so I was an assistant and then I got to do real things at every stage. And so I just think we have to have a sense of humility. One of the important things to understand, Tommy, is that we need to be really, really good at what we do. I meet so many people that are passionate about the gospel and they love, you know, they love Jesus and they want to tell that story. The problem is they're not a very good writer. They're not a very good director. They're not a very good actor. They're not a very good producer. And if you can't do your job well, no one's going to pay attention. I always tell young filmmakers that want to come to Hollywood. I say, don't lead with your faith, lead with your talent. If you come out here and meet with a movie producer, or meet with a studio, an executive, and tell them you're here to change Hollywood for the gospel, they'll just laugh. They'll, they'll just throw you out of the building. But if you come out here and you impress them with your amazing ability as a producer, a director, a writer, a camera operator, if you can really impress them with your skill and talent, they'll listen to anything you have to say. So that opens a door. Being really good at your job opens up a remarkable door for you to be able to talk about the gospel or talk about whatever you're passionate about. So I just always tell people, learn a skill. That's so incredibly important and be good at what you do if you're going to make a real impact out there. Thank you for that uh, advice. It really helps. Um, and especially um, our mentor talks about, you know, this pandemic, you know, people yeah. are complaining about the pandemic here in the Philippines. Everyone in social media is complaining about the pandemic. News is just about pandemic. Yes. <laughs> and um, our mentor keeps reminding us, um, reinvent yourself. Yes. You know, reinvent yourself. What can you say about reinventing That's yourself? That's a great word. That's a great issue. Um, I wrote a book early in my career called Jolt, Get the Jump on a World That's Constantly Changing. It was one of my first big books that I wrote. And uh, in the book, I, I, some of the research I uncovered was that people hate to change. Uh, you know, if you're a leader, if you're a pastor, if you're a business owner, you know people just hate to change. In fact, one study indicated patients that have open heart surgery within a year or so go back to their old lifestyle, eating fried foods and smoking and drinking, you know, the thing that got them into trouble in the first place. So the fear of death doesn't make most people change. But here's something interesting about this pandemic. Ever since the lockdown started, we've been hearing there's a new normal out there. Things are going to be different. Things are going to change. We hear it every night on the evening news. We hear it in primetime television. We hear it online constantly, constantly. We're hearing things are going to be different. Things are going to change, which means I really believe that this is the moment. If you want to change anything about your life, this is the moment. We have, I, I just think we're in a time right now when people are more open to change than they will ever be in your lifetime or my lifetime. So I, I'm telling pastors, for instance, if you want to change something about your church, now is the time. If you want to change your ministry team, if you want to change the color of the sanctuary, if you want to change the logo, or I've even had pastors call me recently wanting to change their church's name, whatever it is you want to change. And the same is true for business leaders. If you want to change something about your company, this is the moment because people will not resist change right now. They're expecting change to happen. And I also think for us personally, as we think people who are listening to this conversation, I think this is the moment we need to think about maybe reinventing ourselves. Coming out of this virus, coming out of this lockdown is a great time to start thinking about what we want to change in our own lives. I, I really believe that, that we have little reinventions all the time. You know, almost every day with me, I'm always thinking about what I could do better, how I could change my life and be more productive or be more creative or be a better producer, be a better writer. I'm always thinking about those things, but about... In my experience, about every seven to 10 years, we need to think about having a major, major reinvention of our lives. Sometimes those reinventions happen because we want them to. Other times they happen because somebody forced it on us. For instance, when I was 36 years old, I got fired from my job. I was 
I was directing a television program for a big organization here in the U.S., and a new generation of leadership came into the organization, and they didn't think they didn't think they didn't like me very much. They didn't like my ideas very much, and so I got fired. And the interesting thing was, it was a shock. But later I realized it was actually God firing me because I knew God wanted me to come to Hollywood. He wanted me to come to Los Angeles, wanted me to launch out on my, my own. But, you know, I had a good job. Our kids were in a good school. We had a great church. And I kept thinking, you know, Lord, maybe I can put that off or maybe we can, I can commute and fly from the Midwest to where I am in, you know, where you want me to be in Hollywood. But I think the Lord finally got tired of me fighting it, and uh, he got me fired. And I had to have a major reinvention at, my, at that point in my life. I had to rethink everything I did. And so I think we need to think about from time to time. So two or three, let me give you two or three things to think about. If you're considering reinventing your life, let me give you a couple things to think about. Number one, think about what's working in your life and what's not working. You know, every once in a while, we get to a place where we realize I'm not so excited about my job anymore. I'm not passionate about the people I work with. I, maybe God's leading me in a different direction. So most of us ignore that. We just don't stop and reflect and think about what about my life is working and what's not working. And based on that, we can start making some changes. And another thing I think I'd suggest is just don't get stuck. I got stuck in the Midwest and here in the U.S. all those years ago when I was 36 and it you know, God had to fire me to get my attention. And I've had a couple other situations between then and now where I've just gotten stuck in, you know, an old way of doing things. We need to always be open to not getting stuck in the way we work and our relationship with God and our skill. We always ought to be learning new things. That's so very, very important. And I also think it's important to develop a lot of relationships with people. One of the reasons when I got fired, I landed on my feet and I did, you know, I, I really took off is because I knew so many people. I'd spent a lot of time developing relationships. So when I got fired, I just reached out to some people and they started giving me projects to do and giving me you know, work to do here and work to do there. And before long, I was launching my company. And the last thing I would say is it's never too old to reinvent your life. If somebody's watching our conversation, listening to our conversation right now, and you think I'm in my 50s or my 60s, my 70s, even in your 80s, I can just tell you it's never too late. Some of the greatest things, I can tell you worldwide, some of the greatest things, greatest writers, inventors, uh, statesmen, politicians, just amazing people who actually found what they were supposed to be doing really late in life. I wrote a book years ago called One Big Thing, Discovering What You Were Born to Do. And in that book, I talk about a number of different people who really understood, really finally figured out at the end of their career what they were called to do, what they were really wired and born to do. And when they figured it out, they went out there and had a huge impact on the world. So I just want to tell you, it's never too late. Never give up. Never think, you know, your time is over. There's a time to do what God's called you to do. So I just encourage people who are listening to our conversation that in reinventing your life is a smart thing to do. I always think in terms of seven to 10 years, what should I do to make changes? Here, here's one of the things that important, Tommy, is that the job market is changing so quickly now. I mean, think of all the jobs that used to be around that don't even exist anymore. And I wonder all the jobs today that won't exist in five or 10 years from now. So we always need to be up on what's going on, what's happening so that we can stay on, on the cutting edge. And I think that's really important. And that's why I believe so much in people really being intentional about reinventing their life. You know, um, thank you for sharing that on reinventing. Um, especially, I'm just to give an idea, you mentioned you're 36 when you got fired. I'm currently, I'm 38, um, based on some studies and depending on what studies. I'm a Gen X, yep. the youngest Gen X, but I'm yep. also the oldest Gen Y in some studies, but <laughs> it, I, it's a it's a crossroad. Yeah. <laughs> but, because today's millennial, uh, I can really relate to them. Millennials do not last in a career, probably three years or less. Three years That's or true. less. That's true. That's um, true. What made you, what probably we want to ask and learn is what motivated you? What are the things that happened in your media career that excited you? Were there people that excited you working yeah. with that helped you? or 
what what are your motivations during those times that That's allowed you to continue? Great question. And, and you, you're right about being right on that border between Gen X and millennials. It's an interesting place to be. And, you know, we're finding that millennials do shift jobs frequently. However, they don't always change their career. Very often they change who they work for or where they work, but they're not necessarily changing the bigger picture vision. That's the way I was. I worked for an organization in the Midwest. Uh, then I launched my own company when I was 36, our Cook Media Group, you mentioned earlier. And um, although I work for different clients and do different type of projects, it's all still the same overarching vision. So it's uh, in my in my experience, it's OK to change places where you work or companies you work with, but try to find that one big thing. I call it one big thing that you feel called to do. What were you put on the earth to accomplish? I think if people can figure that out, it really, really makes a difference. And motivation matters. I'll tell you this, uh, Tommy, it's interesting that. I'm not a big believer in passion. I mean, let me say something that's probably going to make some people upset here. Um, you know, so many people talk about, I want to, I'm passionate about my job, or I want to be passionate about this, or find a career that you're passionate about. A lot of people will tell you, find a career you're passionate about. The problem I have with that is I meet people all the time that are passionate about something. They're just not very good at it. I'll give you a great example. I get screenplays for movies sent to me all the time by writers who will say, Phil, I'm so passionate about writing. And I read the screenplay and I want to think, yeah, but you're terrible at it. You're a horrible writer. So my advice is don't worry about passion so much. Try to figure out what you're really wired to do. Take a hard look at your skills, your abilities. I mean, if you're a great writer, are you really, really a good writer, not just a passionate writer? And one thing I've discovered is that once you figure out what you're really created to do, what your where your gifts are, where your talents are, and you can figure that out pretty easily. I mean, ask people around you, what, you know, what do they see in you? Sometimes other people see things that we don't. And look back over the course of your life. Were you the person that always got called on because you were creative and then people needed an idea? Or were you the person that got called on because you were great with numbers and you could balance a budget? Um, what were the reasons people wanted to have you on their team? Or what are the reasons people wanted to work with you or have you as a friend? Those kind of things can give you an idea of what I'm really, really good at doing. And I'll tell you this, if you can figure that out, once you figure out what you're wired to do, what you're created to do, what God's called you to do, you're going to get pretty passionate about that pretty quick. So it's interesting. I don't pursue passion first. I pursue first what I feel like my skill is set is at. What am I really good at doing? I, I, I'll be honest with you. I think I wasted probably 10 to 15 years of my career pursuing my passion only to realize at the, I was pretty good at it, but at the level I wanted to go, I was not going to be able to go there. And then when I stepped back and discovered what I'm really created to do, then my career took off. So I just say passion is not the indicator. If you're passionate about something, make sure you're always, also really, really good at it because that's what's going to get the world's attention. That's what's going to get you an audience. That's what's going to get people to hear your message. And that's ultimately what matters. Okay. You know, um, thank you for sharing that because you kind of confirm me a lot of things. Um, currently, I'm taking courses right now because I'm trying to reinvent myself. And one of the specialization I'm taking is about human resource because it's a quite a shortage here in the Philippines. You know, you answered the question completely because uh, you talked about there are three things that yeah. a person must have right now, not salary, which is you said about competence. Yes. Which you're talking about the inventing yourself. You're talking about you have to be excellent on something, autonomy that allows you to have a free hand how to go about it. And relatedness, you were telling about me how you connected with people. So those kind of motivations, is look, they look essential to this day and age even they more. They are. They are. And I, and I think people skills are really, really important. I, I often tell people your ability to work. Let's see. What, what, what do I say? I say your, your skills with people are more important than the skills it takes to do your job. So I don't care if you're a brilliant filmmaker. If you can't get along with anybody, you're never going to be able to make a movie. If you're a great pastor, if nobody likes you, they're never going to come to your church. 
So you have to have really, really good people skills. Learn how to get along with people. Learn how to inspire people. Um, I've also said, if you want to be a leader, you've got to be able to stand up in front of people and cast your vision. So people skills are really critical. So if, if somebody's listening to this conversation who's maybe an introvert, they're bashful, they're shy, I would urge you start practicing, get out there, network, meet with people, because A, people can really help get you from where you are to where you want to be. But also those kind of people skills can make a dramatic difference in the course of your career. Anyway, you know, I mentioned earlier, I read your, your book, The Way Back. Um, yes. You know, um, I want to ask more about it also, especially, sure. it's helpful. you know, before I ask you about it, it struck me about you shared about what Billy Graham told you, you know, about politics, you know, it really helped me not to speak about politics in social media. <laughs> I don't talk about it. <laughs> I don't post anything about it. It really helped me when you wrote about that, when you discussed about that. Can you discuss more about the idea behind The Way Back? Sure. You know, we, my, my co-writer, Jonathan Bach, and I spent a lot of hours sitting around a, a fire pit or a fireplace talking about why Christianity is disappearing from our culture. Why does it have so little impact, particularly in Western nations? It's almost disappearing. And it's so frustrating to see the direction our country and our culture is going. And we are media guys. I mean, John's a marketing guy. I'm a producer. And we think, you know, we immediately think it's because we're not telling our story very well. And I think that's a part of it. But we started thinking we're not telling our story well, but we started studying Christians. And it's interesting. We, we thought, you know, we want to be known as Christians from, you know, the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, long suffering, those great things that the Bible talks about. That's how we want to be known. But if I don't know about it, Manila, but if you went out on the street here in Los Angeles and asked people at random, what do you think of when you think of Christians? You get words more like phony or hypocrite uh, or jerk or power hungry. You get really ugly names. And so we tried to figure, why do people look at us like that? And so we started studying Christians and we, we pulled in some big research companies and we started studying Christians who not just call themselves Christians, but people that show up in church, people who are serious about it. And what we found out was horrifying. It was terrible. What we found out was 40% of Christians, church-going Christians in America, read the Bible once a month, rarely or never. 40%, that's almost half the church-going Christians in America, read the Bible once a month, rarely or never. When it comes to prayer, we found out that 63% of church, people in the pews on Sunday mornings, people in church, 63% or 60, yeah, 63 believe prayer is important. And we thought, okay, 63%, that's a that's good. But then we realized the flip side is that 37%, uh, more than a third of church-going Christians don't believe prayer is important. Uh, we also found out if you show up at church just three out of eight Sundays, three out of eight Sundays, you're considered a regular now. The pastor's thrilled if you just show up three Sundays out every two months, just three Sundays is all we, we need. That bar is so low. People just aren't coming to church. And then, of course, we, we discovered with giving, you know, less than 10% of Church-going Christians give 10% of their income to the work of the gospel. So when we looked at those numbers, Tommy, what we discovered was we're doing a terrible job living our lives as Christian people. You know, our, the great threat to Christianity is not Hollywood. It's not Islam. It's not, you know, Middle Eastern terrorists. The greatest threat to Christianity in America or American Christians, because we're doing such a terrible job. It's like we become the fat guy in the gym that lectures everybody about health. You know, we're telling everybody else about how to live their life, but we're not living the life. And we're like, if you went into Coca-Cola, you know, the headquarters of Coca-Cola and you found out everybody there was drinking Pepsi, obviously there's a problem. So we discovered that if we want to change the culture, if we really want to make an impact, the first thing we've got to do is start living the kind of life God has called us to live. And until we get serious about that, the, the world looks at us and just thinks of hypocrites. They look at us and see, we're not attending church. We're not reading the Bible. We're, we're not giving to the work of God. All those things, we've got to get serious if we're going to really make an impact. So that was the reason really we wrote the book. Thank you. Um, anyway, I guess we've discussed a lot of it, 
especially uh, I won't mention your age. They can Google you. Thank you. <laughs> they can Google you. You're a public figure. And now we want to know more about your you, basically. Um, probably we want to ask is, what is your most popular project that you made so far in your career? Probably most popular. Oh, that would be hard to say. We've done so many different things. We've done uh, a lot of television specials, some movies, um, just uh, tons of commercials, advertising, all kinds of stuff. We really believe in being creative as possible. Um, we've done work with some of the major ministry organizations out there. There's a new museum of the Bible here in Washington, D.C. in the United States, a billion-dollar museum, totally focused on the history, the story, and the impact of the Bible. And we've done all the media for that museum in the last five, six, seven years. It's a relatively new museum and we've done all their media. We produce programs in probably about 70 countries around the world. And we've gotten to work with some great ministry organizations uh, doing some remarkable things. We just finished um, a documentary, a feature documentary on the rise of Christianity in Asia. And uh, right before the lockdown, just the last fall, we were filming in our uh, two, you know, a year ago, we were filming in um, China, Mongolia, Korea, Japan, and India. And we were telling the story of how Christianity came to the Far East. And so it was really a fascinating, fascinating documentary. And we love filming those kinds of projects. And um, so, and then the other thing we do too, Tommy, is we, we consult with a lot of organizations. A lot of, when I started out in my career, camera equipment was really expensive. If you wanted to shoot a film or a video, it was very, very expensive. But today, the prices have dropped so much that even small churches have video gear. And so we go in a lot of times and help them, teach them how to use it well, how to, some churches are doing television programs. Some are doing a lot of social media and video. They're developing YouTube channels. And we go in and advise major churches and ministries about how to be more effective with the media, how to get their story told. And I, I just love doing that. And we travel all over the world. That's why we were in Manila a few years ago. And we just love doing that every opportunity we can get. You know, there's one thing I learned from you also from your career. Um, it's a popular word. It's bootstrapping. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. It's, I've, been, I've been taking courses in entrepreneurship also. I realized, wow, this is something we Filipinos must learn. Especially we have this tendency that let's wait for conditions to be perfect before we act. Rather than let's yeah. make most of whatever imperfect condition we have, we make most out of it. And when I was studying it, hey, that's the idea of boot, bootstrapping. And I realized the only way for you to become excellent is you can make most of whatever you have right now. So yeah, um, anyway. that's really true. That's really true. And let me tell you, um, in the you know with the advent of of mobile mobile devices, mobile phones, anybody can make a movie now. In fact, in the United States. There are two film festivals, major film festivals, just for movies shot on a phone. So it's amazing what people are doing out there. And because we do so, so much social media on our phone, so much video, people are used to seeing that kind of look now. So never, ever think you have to wait for more money, wait for a bigger crew, wait for more expenses, uh, experience. I always say, just get out there and shoot. Just start filming. Tell the story. Get used to telling your story. I can't tell you the number of people that are making feature films right now that got started shooting on a phone or a super cheap, inexpensive video camera. So you're exactly right. Bootstrapping is about using what you have just take whatever you have and going out and telling your story and uh, it's funny i was having this conversation just yesterday with a ministry and who wants to t do some documentary films and we were talking about you know you don't have to have that super high level of quality anymore in fact sometimes it hurts you because people are so used to seeing the reality and the authenticity of social media so you're exactly right i think people i would encourage people don't wait, get out there, start telling stories, start using the media, start telling stories and, and you'll start building your confidence and you'll get better and better and better. Okay, so before we end, um, we also want to ask is, well, because Filipinos love eating, what's your favorite food anyway? <laughs> when I was in, was I, 
<laughs> you took me by surprise. Sorry. When I was in the Philippines, I ate everything. I mean, I'm telling you what, I just love the food there. And so we went down to Cebu and um, we, we did a conference down there while we were there. And man, that food was just out of this. It was just amazing. So, I, but I haven't ever, honestly, Tommy, I've never found the food I don't like. Um, I just eat about anything you put in front of me and I do love it. My wife is a brilliant cook. She's got She's part French and she's a great, great cook. I'm a terrible cook, but I'm a great eater. And so um, I'm, I'm a big food fan. You, next time I come, we'll go out somewhere because I love to eat. Okay. Ironic, that's their last name, cook. <laughs> oh, I know, true, good point, good, well said. <laughs> you know, um, especially it's, I do not know. Do we still call this new normal? Well. Do they I, just you know, know good question. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I do, I get, I'm getting my last vaccine tomorrow. And so I'm coming out of this, but, uh, and I've always been, I've been traveling the whole time. I've been on airplanes. I've been all over the place, shooting projects, working with clients. Um, I'm a little bit more um, open, you know, during the pandemic. And um, so I've always felt like uh, things are moving forward, but I do see that people are getting more confident and they're coming out of this. And I'll tell you this, maybe, and this is our last word, is that um, for churches and ministry organizations that are live streaming their service, let me just say this, this is not the time to ease up on that. This is not the time to take your foot off the gas pedal when it comes to live streaming. I really believe live streaming worship services, live streaming all kinds of programs is here to stay. And I think we should really focus. We've seen an amazing impact the church had you know during the lockdown hollywood was a, was shut down completely and over the last year the church churches around the world have produced more media than hollywood has and i think people have really embraced it and i'm seeing some amazing results and so i just encourage if you're a pastor ministry leader out there communications person in a church i just say keep going keep doing amazing things with your live stream getting the message out there online because i think it's so important and uh, if there was anything I could close with, it would be that. The future is great. I've, I'm seeing some remarkable things out there. So, But I would say, keep being creative. Be unusual. Don't just shoot the normal service. Make something really creative and unusual that would minister to people who are watching on their phone or a mobile device or watching at home on a computer. That's going to be the key. So before we end, uh, we'll ask a few about your up your projects, um, especially bootstrapping. You know, I bootstrapped last year. I started my own podcast because I joined this particular group. So it's really a, it's not okay. perfect, but it's a, I saw that you have a podcast. What's the name of your podcast? You want to promote that? Yeah, I have a podcast. Well, you can search it. You can search it for Phil Cook. I'll, I'll tell you what, if, if people will go to my blog, it's, it's philcook.com and I'm cook with an E, P-H-I-L-C-O-O-K-E.com. You can find my podcast there. You can find my books. You can find the stuff I write about. Um, I would just encourage people to go and check it out. But my podcast is really about the intersection of faith, media, and culture. And I write about Hollywood. I mean, I, I, I teach about media. I teach about producing programs. I teach about engaging the culture today. And so I'd encourage people to check out my podcast. I think if you really feel that God's called you into the media in some way, I think it'll help you a lot and answer a lot of questions you have. And I also interview a lot of famous producers and um, all kind of professionals from here in Hollywood. So I think you'll really enjoy it. So thanks for bringing that up, Tommy. I think people really get really benefit by the, by the podcast. So I'll repeat that. It's Phil. Cook. Yeah, Phil, philcook.com is, is my, my, my website. Yeah, philcook.com. And you can go, you, you know, you can go on iTunes. You can go on YouTube. I have a video version of the podcast on YouTube. Just search for the Phil Cook channel. Same thing on iTunes or Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast. I'm there. And um, people can find it pretty easily. In fact, if you just Google Phil Cook, it'll come up. Yeah, just Google Phil Cook. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> and thank you for your time. Honestly, we appreciate it. Uh, even though we had a confusion, I'm learning from you also. It's really no, I can't. Really I can't nice. wait to come back to the Philippines. This has been fun. Yeah. It, it, great questions, and um, I hope people enjoy it. And I can't wait to get back there. So 
Thank you, Phil Cook. And that's for our segment, our segment exclusive. Hope to see you again to our, for our next episode.